Hey guys, it's Heidi with AMP Home Church and welcome to day five of our 90 day setting your mind on eternity, seeing the unseen, Bible study, devotional, um, whatever you wanna call it. Sorry this video is coming out a little late. Um, sometimes life likes to jump up and throw us curveballs, and so I wanted to have these out bright and early every morning so that way you can work them into whatever time of your day works best for you. Um, so I'm going to try my hardest to always make that happen. But today, as the wrap up to week number one, we're gonna be doing it in the afternoon. So, sorry for the delay. If you are new and just joining us, welcome. These are all on a Seeing the Unseen playlist, so you can go back, catch up on day one. Down in the description box, I have a link to our blog post where I share all of the things with all of the links, where to get the book, more about it, our church, our services, everything's online. All the stuff is down there. <laughs> so I don't think anything's been left out. Um, definitely recommend um, if you guys are looking and you want to come and join us, we do share every Sunday. We have a service um, going through just Bible teaching um, with my husband and then his associate pastor, Travis. So we've got some really cool stuff going on. Lots of stuff we are praying over is how best to serve you all because it's not about us. It's not about what we want. It's about setting our minds on eternity, right? And the things that truly last and truly make a difference. And that's what um, we always want to be mindful of. So I, um, I haven't gotten to personally respond to all of the comments and things that have come in. I'm going to hopefully get to work on that today. Um, but we have been reading all of them as they come in and discussing my husband and I kind of going through these things. And it has been such a blessing to see you guys really, you know, dig into this and what you guys are getting out of it and the conversations we've had based off of that. So please comment, come join into the conversation. Um, we'd love to talk more about this because there is really nothing more important. I don't think really for our lives as Christians than this conversation. Um, this is very, very serious, how we understand these things and and the scripture that we're, we're pouring over to truly just grow in our understanding and knowledge of God's wisdom and his truth. So all of that to say, I am super excited. We'll go ahead into day five here. I am only going to put out videos Monday through Friday um, just to give people a chance to catch up on the weekends or whatever it may be. But Monday through Friday, the videos will go up for this. So Saturday and Sunday, there will not be a video. You don't need to read ahead. Um, on Monday, we'll pick up in day six and continue on. So we're, we're gonna, there'll be a video for every day. They'll just come out Monday through Friday, if that makes sense. So day five is titled Only One Way. It says, if we want to arrive in heaven, we cannot go through Buddha, Muhammad, or Moses. We can only go through Jesus big topic. This is a big topic and it's a big one, not only just in the world in general, but even within the Christian church today. So I'm excited to see what he has to say here. You may be troubled, feeling apprehensive about what awaits after your death. Make sure of your relationship with Jesus Christ. Be confident that you trust him alone to save you, not anyone or anything else, and certainly not any good works you've done. And this is where it's hard because even within the church, we have so many, you know, you, you have to do this, I have to do this, I have to do that. And this is where we start having some major issues. Jesus didn't say, I am a way and a truth and a life. I'm one of the ways to come to the Father. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, right? We see that in John 14, 6. He was very clear. Anyone wishing to fly from Portland, Oregon to North Carolina can get there a number of ways. We can fly through Denver, Minneapolis, Chicago, Detroit, Salt Lake City, Dallas, or Atlanta. But if I want to arrive in heaven, and we certainly should want that, we cannot go through Buddha, Muhammad, or Moses. We can only go through Jesus. Amen. A um, couple scriptures that he has noted here. First one is Acts chapter 4, verse 12, which says, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. 2 Corinthians 6, 2 says, Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And then the perspectives from God's people that he has noted here. The first one from John Stott. The essence of sin in man substitute sorry, the essence of sin is man substituting himself for God, while the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man. It's 
amazing. C.S. Lewis said, Fallen man is not simply an imperfect creature who needs improvement. He is a rebel who must lay down his arms. This is kind of crazy because obviously nothing was like we we had no we have no affiliation with Randy Alcorn. We're just like super fans that think he's an amazing man of God and wanted to share his book with you guys. We have not pre-planned anything, literally. Um, my husband has only shared with me a itsy bitsy little blip of what he wanted to share with his Wednesday night message. And now I believe as he's feeling led by the spirit, he will be sharing it this Sunday, fairly certain. Just the like itsy bitsy blip <laughs> that he has shared with me complements this very well. Very interesting. So hopefully you guys can come and join us for Sunday and you can hear what he has to say because I find that rather interesting. Okay, I wanna go up. There is a PDF packet with some questions and thoughts. I want you guys, let's dig into these. Let's discuss these things. Really, let's look at these things. And I know you guys are, and it's been so amazing to see um, kind of your guys' process that you've shared through this. But I wanna go, um, Every day at the bottom of the post, he has one of his blog posts that he recommends that kind of correlate with this. And this one's a big topic, so it might take a few minutes, but I want to read through it because I think it's really important. Um, it's epm.org forward slash different ways. If you want to pull it up, which I am going to do here. I'm going to take a drink of coffee. Okay, and mind you, this was written July 23rd of 2008. It is titled, Many Who Attend Evangelical Churches Now Believe There Are Different Ways to Heaven. This is a huge topic because many do believe this. I mean, there have been Gallup polls and different things that, you know, these vast percentages of Christians believe that as long as you're an overall good person, you can make it to heaven, right? Um, many churches today preach a message that is complete opposite of the gospel and of what God's word says. And we have to be Bereans. We have to be searching the scriptures. We have to be reading every single day and digging into these things and really standing firm in truth and protecting it um, and making sure that we are constantly going through and looking at these things. Hey, where am I? Am I on this right path? Lord, please, I trust you to plant my feet firm on the right path. Guard me from all of this false teaching and nonsense that's out there. Help me to remove the world from my life and focus on your word as I look forward to your return. We really need to look at these things. So let's read what he said again in 2008. Last month, a UPI report began as follows. America remains a nation of believers, but a new survey finds most Americans don't feel their religion is the only way to eternal life, even if their faith tradition teaches otherwise. So I can only imagine how, how the, much bigger the impact, I'm trying to find my words, this must be now, 12 years later, than it was when this came out. So if anything, what we're going to read is even more so in a bigger portion. You know what I mean? The findings revealed Monday in a survey of 35,000 adults can either be taken as a positive sign of growing religious tolerance or disturbing evidence that Americans dismiss or don't know fundamental teachings of their own faiths. I think that's the scary part. Among the more startling numbers in the survey conducted last year by the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life, 57% of evangelical church attenders said they believe many religions can lead to eternal life in conflict with traditional evangelical teaching. You are not going to find that message in the Bible. There is only one way. That's it. No ifs, ands, or buts. Um, he links here in the blog post that you can go and pull up the rest of the story that originally, you know, took place. But he's just kind of introducing this as the point to what he's going to get into. He says 57% of evangelical church attenders said they believe many religions can lead to eternal life. Whatever happened to truth, not just in our culture, but in our churches? And what does evangelical mean anymore? Fair point. If you guys have not watched... 
American Gospel, which there's a second one out now. Um, I believe you have to purchase the second one, but I believe you can find the first one for free on YouTube. Just search the American Gospel. I know many of you have seen it already and, and learned a ton from it, but definitely, definitely recommend it. Um, I know my husband has like oodles of podcasts on the topic, um, kind of in all of this area here, if you guys are interested. I mean, just reach out and ask if you can't find it. He goes on to say though, truth is factual, but it's more than mere facts. It's not just something we act upon. It acts upon us. We cannot change the truth, but the truth can change us. Jesus prayed for us in John 17, 17, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Truth sets us apart from the falsehoods woven into our sin nature, championed by the world, and skillfully spun into webs by the devil. I thought that was powerful. God has written his truth on human hearts. With Romans 2.15, we see that. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. Shame and twinges of conscience come from recognizing that truth has been violated. When people hear truth spoken graciously, many are drawn to it because of the moral vacuum they feel. Hearts long for truth, even hearts that reject it. Remember we talked earlier this week, we all have a Jesus-sized hole in our heart, right? We all have it. Nothing else can fill it. Our spirit is groaning and longing to be reunited with the Lord. We are to walk in the truth. 3 John 1, 3 says, For I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. We are to love the truth and believe the truth. 2 Thessalonians 2, 10. And with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. All truth has a center of gravity, Jesus Christ who he himself declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life in John 14, 6. He didn't say he would show the truth or teach the truth or model the truth. He is the truth, period. Truth personified. He's the source of truth and the reference point for evaluating all truth claims. That's why if we get it wrong about Jesus, it doesn't matter what else we get right. And we see that so often whenever we have you know, my husband has stood firm and talked about anything and people say, well, but they do this. Well, but they do that. Well, it doesn't matter if at the root of it, it's not a biblical Jesus. Nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. The God of truth, as we see in Psalm 31, 5, is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. The devil is a con man, always denying, revising, and spinning the truth, rearranging the price tags. Jesus said there is no truth in him. He called him a liar and the father of lies. He said when he lies, he speaks his native language. John 8, 44. Satan is a natural when it comes to deception. He's eloquent, smooth, persuasive, believable, and we are so gullible. Look at the numbers that places like Bethel bring in. Hillsong, Elevation Church, all of the Word of Faith, NAR, I mean, you can go on for days. The numbers that are brought in, the, the scary part almost today is if you see a pastor or a church that has a large following, it's usually because they're not teaching sound doctrine. I feel so bad, but we have so many people that reach out and say, hey, I'm trying to find a local church in my area. They send us a few, which my husband is happy to go over and look at different things, read doctrines, listen to some sermons as associate pastor as well. They love to do that for people. But it's almost a dead giveaway when they send it over and we pull up like the Instagram page and you see thousands and thousands of followers. If there's a blue verified check mark, that's almost a dead giveaway. And that is so sad, but again, we are so gullible and false teaching is rampant. When we speak the truth, we speak Christ's language. When we speak lies, we speak Satan's language. Plain and simple. You and I can discover truth, but we cannot create it. What's true is true and what's not is not for all of us for all of time. Our culture views truth as something inside us, something to subject to revision according to our growth and enlightenment. Scripture views truth as something outside of us, which we can believe or not, but we can never sway. 
Truth isn't about our own perceptions or desires. It's always about reality with a capital R. A majority of us could agree that we'd like gravity to be suspended tomorrow, but our vote would have no impact on reality. Americans embrace democratic ideals. This gives us the illusion that we should have a voice when it comes to truth, but the universe isn't a democracy. Truth isn't a ballot measure. We easily confuse what we want to be truth with what actually is true. C.S. Lewis said he wrote to expound mere Christianity, which is what it is and was what it was long before I was born, whether I like it or not. All of us have a theology. The only question is whether it's true or false. Much teaching today is popularity-driven, not truth-driven. Look at the seeker-sensitive movement today. It's so far out of control. I mean, 2008 was nothing compared to what we see today in 2020. The time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Paul said it best there in 2 Timothy 4.3 because that is exactly like down to every last drop what we're seeing today. A popular novel excels at showing God's grace and love. I applaud this. For those whose lives are touched by this, I sincerely rejoice. But the same novel has God say, In Jesus I have forgiven all humans for their sins against me. Even those who have not confessed or repented of their sins? The God character says to a man, Because I have no expectations, you never disappoint me. Really? Never? Even when we sin against him? He says, I don't need to punish people for sin. Sin is its own punishment, devouring you from the inside. It's not my purpose to punish it. It's my joy to cure it. Yes, his joy is to cure it, but doesn't scripture promise he will punish sin? I have heard many people say, it's just a story. Don't treat it like it's theology. But stories capture our hearts and imaginations and affect our beliefs. So they're not just stories. I know, I write stories, and they do convey truth. I've received many letters from people whose beliefs were changed through reading my novels. Um, I don't know what book he's referencing with that story, but... Um, I believe that everything I write, fiction or nonfiction, is subject to scrutiny by God's word. And I do have to share, that is one reason why we are so happy to share the work of Randy Alcorn, because... I, I'm not putting him on a pedestal, no human is perfect, and all of those things... But to see him and his wife who truly are walking the walk and, and doing all of the things that any Christian with a platform should be doing um, in his work and his scrutiny to scripture, even in his nonfiction writings, um, we really do recommend him because, um, I mean, he, he, to see someone who takes this seriously is amazing. So um, that's why we're so happy to share, you know, these different things with you guys, because he does. Everything is subject to scrutiny by God's word. We should take our cues from the Berean Christians who receive the message with great eagerness and examine the scriptures every day to determine whether they, what they were being taught was true. We see that in Acts 17, 11. We must be Bereans. We must be studying the scriptures so that when something is said, sometimes by absolute innocent mistake, sometimes because you just didn't understand what it was, whatever the case may be, we have to make sure that everything is held up to God's word. Not my feelings, not my opinion, because there are plenty of things in scripture that when I read them, it hits me. Oh my gosh, like a pound of bricks. And I'm like, I don't like that. <laughs> That's not the answer I like with that. That's really tough. That's really hard. That goes against what I've always been taught, what I feel, what my heart's telling me, whatever the case may be. God's word changes us. We don't change his word. Again, he states from John 14, 6, John, John, Jesus didn't say, I am a way, a truth, a life. I am one way to come to the Father. He said, I am what? the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. This spring, back in 2008, Oprah said on her television program that when it comes to getting to heaven, there couldn't possibly be just one way. So does Oprah know something Jesus didn't know? Or did Jesus know something Oprah doesn't know? No offense, Oprah, but I'm putting my money on Jesus. <laughs> Raised in a culture that condemns such thinking as narrow and intolerant, even many Christians now consider it arrogant and out of date to say that only those who trust in Jesus will go to heaven. 
It certainly would be arrogant if we were the ones who came up with it, but we didn't. We're just repeating what Jesus said. We're not trusting ourselves, we're trusting him. If it were up to us, we'd think up something more popular, wouldn't we? But it's not up to us. He said it. Our choice is to believe it or reject it. I, for one, am not going to tell God he's mistaken. Sadly, some Christians now imagine it inappropriate to share Christ with people of other faiths. When Jews for Jesus comes to town on an evangelistic com campaign, there are always Christians who say we have no right to be evangelizing Jews. But let's consider that a moment. If you see someone canoeing down rapids 100 feet from a waterfall, getting his attention and shouting a warning may cause the canoeist some anxiety. But is smiling, waving, and keeping quiet the loving thing to do? Of course not. That would be apathy or rank cowardice. And that's, again, my husband's going into this week, and that's why it's so crazy all of this comes together. But that's what's so important. We're told to, to help in snatching people from the coming fire. Do you understand what's coming? Everybody has an eternity. In heaven or in hell that's huge and if there is only one way to heaven that's a really big deal some consider hell to be the invention of wild-eyed prophets obsessed with wrath they argue that Christians should take the higher road of Christ's love but this perspective overlooks a conspicuous reality in the Bible Jesus says more than anyone else about hell Matthew 10, 28, Matthew 13, 40 through 42, Mark 9, 43 through 44. He refers to it as a literal place and describes it in graphic terms, including raging fires and the worm that doesn't die. Christ says the unsaved will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth in Matthew 8, 12. In his story of the rich man and Lazarus, Jesus revealed that in hell the wicked suffer terribly are fully conscious, retain their desires and memories and reasoning, long for relief, cannot be comforted, cannot leave their torment, and are bereft of hope. Luke 16, 19 through 31, pull it up. Yikes. The Savior could not have painted a more bleak or graphic picture. Do we think we are more loving than Jesus? Going to an eternal hell isn't in anyone's best interests. How dare we, in the name of the false grace we now revere as tolerance, withhold true grace from those Jesus came to rescue? Truth without grace is not real truth, and grace without truth is not real grace. Say it again for the people in the back. Truth without grace is not real truth, and grace without truth is not real grace. I might make a t-shirt of that because that <laughs> I feel like that might take care of a few things if we really, really understood that statement. It may seem narrow and insensitive to say Jesus is the only way to the Father, but our job isn't to serve as his speech writers and spin meisters and PR teams seeking to reinvent his message and improve his poll numbers. Come on now, guys. Our job is not to try to improve on what he said, but to believe it and share it. Who with? People who desperately need to meet the one who endured hell for them on the cross so that they could live forever with him in heaven. He took on all of our sin, all of it, completely spotless, completely blameless, completely innocent. The perfect Passover lamb, which Passover is coming up, you guys. And I am so excited because ah, just it's so important. Get all worked up. I don't even... Ah, I'm going to be on here for hours if I start going into it, so I'll stop. But he took it all on for all of us. And there are many people, even within our own households, our own families, our own friends, circles, neighborhoods, that need to hear it. Standing firm in truth so that they can get the true grace. How many ways to God? How many? The question was answered by someone way smarter that you, me, and Oprah and the 50%, 57% of evangelical church attenders in the recent poll. One way. Jesus. That's it. Nothing else. Not your works. Not what you think feels good. Not what sounds good. Not what's popular. No. One. 
Acts 4.12 says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Amen? So, let's think on this. Let's pray on this. I am so excited to see what you guys have to say about this. I'm going to stop now so I can go get this uploaded and processed and all of those things so you guys can get it. But thank you so much for joining us this week. If you're catching up later on, I'm super glad you're here. These are always going to remain up, so the study is always going to be out there. Pursue God's word. Be in prayer. Hold the mirror up in front of ourselves as we go through these things. If you are feeling convicted, that is God trying to nudge you. Listen. Join us this Sunday at noon or one. I actually don't know if he's going to change the time. The link is down here to come join us. We live stream in a Facebook group. Um, he kind of contemplated moving it later to see if that would better fit some people's schedules. So come check on there. It'll be at noon or one Eastern time this Sunday. Um, sorry, I don't know for sure, but he's not in here right now, so I can't ask him. So anyways, it's going to be really good. I think it's going to fit perfectly with all of this. So I'm kind of excited to see how God's working and moving in all of these things. If there's anything we can do for you guys, please reach out and let us know. We just want to serve you in whatever way is best. So anything we can do, let us know. Otherwise, my coffee is now kind of cold. So I'm going to go put some more hot coffee in here, enjoy my day with my kiddos, and um, really kind of dwell over this stuff. Thank you guys for just joining us and making this first week absolutely amazing. Um, I'm really enjoying it. So I will see you guys all on Monday, um, Sunday, of course, beforehand. And then otherwise, I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. We'll talk to you later. Bye, guys.